Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, and if you want more recent, um, really embarrassing things, you can talk to my husband, Christian, who's over there. Thank you so much for the very nice, uh, very nice introduction. So, what I, it's, it's a little bit strange for me to be here since I've never had a paper in NIPS, but I guess the, uh, the program committee has been doing this. You've been shaking things up a little bit and bringing weird people here, which which I hope is fun for all of you. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, BP, uh, uh, BP algorithms for matching problems, which are mathematical problems, which we can say something rigorous about, to uh, cancer, um, to cancer genomics, which we can't say something rigorous about, but hopefully we can say something useful about. Okay, so first, um, I, I think it's always important for people to learn something. Now, most of you probably know this, but I will tell you what a graphical model is, uh, what BP is. I'll give you the simple, um, the simple example of matching for which uh, I can actually show you how to get uh, the, um, um, the, BP, um, the BP update equations. And I can also um, tell you some theorems that we're able to prove. Then I'll go on to a more complex example, the Steiner tree problem, which is a non-local problem, so it's kind of surprising that we can do this kind of thing with it. And then um, I'll go on to some uh, uh, systems biology um, and some applications of the Steiner tree problem to systems biology. Okay, so uh, we start out with a graphical model or a hypergraphical model, which is a representation of the structure um, of the dependency structure of a collection of random variables with local constraints. Okay, so um, each random variable is going to have some a priori distribution, and then there are going to be constraints which could sit on the edges, which couple those variables. And there's a, a probability distribution here, which um, looks kind of ugly, but, you know, um, and it actually looks much uglier when you put in what these things tend to look like, but, you know, um, it's, it's not hard to deal with it. So the way that people usually look at problems of this sort is they write down a factor graph, which is a bipartite graph. So on one side you have the variables, and on the other side you have the constraints, and you have edges that couple the variables to the constraints. And then what you are interested in calculating are the marginals, that is, um, you integrate out all but one variable, or the mode, so the maximizing, um, the maximizing configurations. So if you're doing a combinatorial optimization problem, you're often looking for a mode of something like this. Okay, so um, BP is, um, and actually some of the founders of this field, um, should be in the audience somewhere here. Um, we rediscovered some of it coming from, um, coming from statistical physics and spin glasses and the cavity method, but when we were done, it looked just like what computer scientists had been doing for 20 years. Um, so it is a method for calculating the marginals and the modes, um, and it's exact if the factor graph is a tree, if it has no loops. So what we do is there are two sets, um, two sets of equations. There are messages, so think of the factor graph. And so on one side we have the variables, and the variables can send a message to a constraint and say, this is the marginal that I would have if I ignored you, okay? And the constraint sends something back and says, this is the marginal that you would have if I were the only constraint that you had to worry about. Okay, and then, um, it turns out that if the factor graph has a very simple structure, then we only have one set of equations, not two sets of equations. Okay, so the fixed point equation, uh, which is exact on trees, just says, hey, I'm the variable and I point to the constraint. If I ignore you, which is what this not equal to C means, then this is what my, my, uh, my marginal is. And this says, 
If I'm the only constraint that you have to worry about, then this is what it is, okay? And these are easy to implement. They're local. They tend to do very well in practice. And so as a mathematician, the first question I would ask is, when does the solution converge to the right answer? When can we prove that it converges to the right answer? Okay, so there are really only a very small number of cases relative to the number of cases where BP is used where we can actually prove something. One is matching problems. So a few years ago, a number of us did things on matching and B-matching. Um, another is the Nash bargaining on networks, which is something that comes up in, um, um, in AGT. And that's a much, more, um, a much more complicated proof. And min cost flow networks, things like that. So there are a few examples. But in most cases, it's used. And we don't know that it converges. And actually, it probably doesn't converge in most cases in which it's used. OK, so a simple example, so that this, this is not abstract. And you can imagine doing it yourself, actually, um, uh, actually deriving it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to look at the maximum weight matching problem. So I'm given a graph. I have vertices, and I have edges. And, and I have weights, which sit on the edges. And what I'd like to do is come up with a perfect matching. So what this means is that there is one and only one edge going into each vertex. OK, so I've got these little pairs, these domino type things here. And then of all the ways of doing this, of pairing them up with nearest neighbors, which is the one such that if I add up all the weights, I'm going to get the maximum number. So that's the maximum weight matching problem. OK, so what is the graphical model here? Here, it's a little bit different than the way people normally write it down. Here, the variables sit on the edges, and the constraints sit on the nodes, right? because an edge is occupied or not occupied. And a node in the perfect matching problem just says one and only one edge can come into each node. OK, so that's all that this is saying. And so then I have a collection of edges that are occupied. And the probability distribution, since I'm a physicist, um, I just take e to the 1 over temperature times the weight. If it's occupied, if it's not, I just have a 1 there. And this just says, coming into each node, I have one and only one occupied edge. OK, so, um, so how do I derive this? OK, well, for notational simplicity, I'm not going to write what the constraints are, because they just look ugly. Um, so now the, the messages. So, what I want now is a message from a variable, which is an edge, to the endpoint where it has the constraint. And so what this is going to say is, this is the value that I would have if I ignored you constraint at the endpoint. Okay? So if I don't have to say that there is one and only one edge coming in there. And then, and because this has this nice structure in the factor graph, we only have to do that. We don't have to do the messages from the constraints to the variables. So we said that all we're going to do is have this thing, which says, oh, going from, uh, from the edge ij, uh, from the, um, edge ij to the vertex j, this is what it is. But xij can be 1, meaning that it's occupied, or 0, meaning that it's not occupied. So instead of calculating one or the other of those, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the log ratio of them, and I'm going to put a beta in there because I'm a physicist. Okay, And so that's what this thing is. So e to the beta mij is the marginal with that thing occupied over the marginal with that thing not occupied. Okay, So how do I derive this? This is really easy. So what I do is I say, if it's not occupied, I'm ignoring the constraint at j. So I don't have to worry about what happens after j. It doesn't matter. That's what the message is, is saying. And I'm saying that this is unoccupied, because I have a 0 here. So this is unoccupied there. So what that means, since there has to be one and only one edge coming into each thing, is that, OK, if this guy i, one of these from the bottom has to be occupied. So that's this one. And all the other ones have to be vacant. OK? Similarly, if I look at this with this occupied, so I'm still not worrying about what's going on up here, but
but now this guy is occupied because I have a one there. Well, that means all of these have to be vacant, and also I have to pay for that one that I put in there. Okay? So now I can just take the ratio of these two. So I take the ratio, and now I have a nice equation for Mij. And it looks even nicer if I take beta to infinity, which is taking temperature to zero. And so this is what I get. So it says the way I'm supposed to update this, I'm supposed to start with the weight that I was given, and then, I'm sub and, and then I subtract off the maximum of all the other guys coming into that point. OK? So now you guys know how to do BP for matching. OK? So the, you, you say that your message starts out as WIJ, as the weight that you were given for that edge. You update it by subtracting the maximum of all the other things coming into it. And then how do you update your matching? A similar derivation shows that I can define my candidate maximum weight matching, which may not even be a perfect matching, by for each site j, it, uh, i, so I just choose an i, and then I choose a candidate edge coming in, and I take the maximum of all the things that are coming into the neighborhood of that. Okay, And I add that to the matching. And when I'm done, I might not even have a matching, because there might have been some other thing coming into that. So at that moment, it's not even a matching, but it's my candidate matching. It's exact on trees. So Yair Weiss is out here someplace, and he proved that BP was exact on trees. He, Bill Freeman, and others proved that BP was exact on trees. But the question is, if we don't have a tree, can we determine when else it converges to the right answer and how fast that happens? OK. so. We can actually prove a rigorous result, and then I'll stop being such a mathematician, but OK. So you can write down the LP relaxation. You know, I'm sure most of you know how to do that, or if you don't, you just look it up in the book. It's very, very simple. OK. And the relevance of this for the theorem is that if this LP has a unique integer optimum, OK, then we can prove that this converges, even if there are loops. We can prove that it converges to the right answer. And we can even tell you how fast, it, or a bound on how fast it gets there. And it's actually quite fast, OK? And you know, I'm showing you what the equations are. I'm not showing you what this proof is, which is you know, several dozen pages. But that's what you do. You take something that's really easy, and you take several dozen pages, and you prove it. OK, so that is a simple example of how you do BP. Now, I want to do BP in a case in which most people don't tend to do it, which is the Steiner tree problem, OK? So the Steiner tree problem, you are given a graph. You're given weights on the edges of the graph. And you're given a set of privileged vertices, privileged nodes on the graph. And you're told your job is to connect all of these privileged nodes in a tree. And of all the ways in which you can do this, take the one such that the sum of the edges is smallest. OK? So you want to minimize the cost. You want to have all these terminals, all these privileged nodes in there. OK? And there are applications in which, you know, oh, I want to you know, connect these together in some peer-to-peer -peer network I care about. You know, these nodes, I don't care about the other ones. I could use the other ones, but I really want to make sure that these get connected to each other. OK? Now, if I were trying to connect A, B, and C, I might just draw a triangle. But if I looked at the weights of the edges of that triangle, just the lengths, just, just use as the weights the, the length, this is actually larger than the sum of these three things. So this guy in here is a Steiner node. So it appears in the optimum solution, OK? But I didn't have to connect it. I just happened to connect it, OK? So these extra nodes which appear in the minimizing solution, but which were not, um, but which were not required to be in there, are called Steiner nodes. So the idea is, why don't I try to do belief propagation to find a minimizing tree? Belief propagation, you just send messages back and forth locally. It tends to be very fast. OK, but as you start to think about it, you realize that what you're being asked to do is you're being asked to find a connected tree. Okay? 
that something is a connected tree is a non-local statement, okay? So you don't normally think of using a local algorithm on something for which your, your optimizer is non-local and you have to verify that it actually satisfies this non-local constraint. So, you know, then, then you think, okay, I can't do this. And then you work with physicists who say, let's come up with a new representation where something that is inherently non-local can be verified in a local fashion. So that's what we did a number of years ago. And it's a kind of weird representation because usually, you know, you assign numbers to variables. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each variable and I'm going to assign each, each node and I'm going to assign two variables to it. I'm going to assign a number and I'm going to assign another node. So each variable, e each node is going to have two things attached to it, a number and another node. Okay, so I'm first going to designate one terminal as the root. I'm just going to choose some root. And I'm going to say that if there's an edge that connects the root to itself, the weight of that edge is zero. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce these two variables for each node. One is going to be a number, an integer. It can be zero, it can be one, it can be two, up to the number of nodes minus one. And the other is going to be another node which I'm going to call the parent. So for each node, I'm going to give you a distance and I'm going to tell you a parent. So each node is going to be represented by a pair, one of which is a number and the other of which is another node. Okay, and why am I doing this strange thing? Okay, well, if you look at a Steiner tree, okay, you realize that now I've, I've designated a particular node as the root. Okay, now I go to this node and I say, well, where is this node with respect to the root? Well, it's actually a distance one from the root. And who is its parent? Well, the root itself is its parent. This guy, he's a distance two from the root. And who is his parent on the path to the root? It's this guy here. So I've put a direction in there by Choosing a privilege site, the root, I've put a direction in there. I tell you the distance from that privilege site, and I tell you who's my parent on, on the way to that site. Now, if I, um, if the, the node in question was not one of the ones that had to appear in the Steiner tree, and it didn't happen to appear because it gave me a, a minimizer, I wouldn't put it in the tree, okay? If I don't put a node into my minimizing tree, then I'm going to say its parent is this node out here at infinity, okay? So the distance is just the distance to the root. The parent, if, if that node is not one of the ones that you choose in your tree, then, and you don't have to choose it if it's not a Steiner node, you might choose it, but you might not, then its parent is this guy out in infinity. If it's the root itself, the root's parent is itself. And otherwise, it's the parent of i in the tree going towards the, the root. OK, and then the cost of the tree, the cost of the tree is going to be the cost of all the weights in the tree itself, the guys that are in the tree, not this guy who's going out to infinity. And now I just write down my constraints. And my constraints are pretty simple. My constraint is that, OK, if you're a terminal, if you're one of these privileged nodes, then you can't be connected to infinity because you better be in the tree. And if the parent of k is equal to j and j is not, um, is not the, node at, um, the node out at infinity and it's not the root, then the parent of j also can't be the node out at infinity because then k would be heading towards infinity, but it's not supposed to be heading towards infinity. And also, my distance is decreased by 1. So these things are just local constraints that if I ensure that they are done properly at each site, I get locally an enforcement of a global constraint. So that's why I'm doing this crazy thing. These look kind of ugly and they're about to look even uglier, there. So that's the constraints. That's the equations that I just told you, like, as delta functions, and here's my weight in there. Okay, doesn't matter. Now, I take this thing, these, these, this 
this thing here, and I do a derivation like we did for the matching problem, and it looks even uglier, and it gives me update equations, and I update at each site what the distance is and what the parent is, you know, but I just do that. Okay, so here's the probability distribution, and I'm going to estimate that, and I could do variance of this. I can say, oh, do a bounded, um, a bounded diameter Steiner tree, so don't have any more than a distance 10 out from the root, or I can do something called the prize collecting Steiner tree, which I'll tell you more about in a couple of minutes. So the results. Okay, rigorous results are almost nil. Okay, if I designate every site as a terminal, Okay, so everybody is privileged. Okay, this is like every kid is gifted. Okay, so if, if, <laughs> if every site is privileged, then the Steiner problem is just the minimum weight spanning tree. Okay, and <laughs> the only rigorous result that's known is if VP converges, then it converges to the right answer. I mean, which just sounds pathetic, but I don't mean to put down this result because it's really hard to prove. Okay. So non-rigorously, we've got a lot more. Non-rigorously, if we compare this BP algorithm to the LP algorithms that were used previously on this library of, of examples of Steiner trees, we get better optima, and more importantly, we get them much, much faster, okay? And on biological data sets, there were some labs that were using LP algorithm Steiner tree methods, and they tried to go from yeast to humans, and they just didn't get anywhere because it didn't scale fast. They kept buying bigger and bigger computers, and really what they needed was a better algorithm. Okay. So, and there's an open mathematical problem, but we're going to go on now to biological problems rather than mathematical problems. Okay? So, I'm going to take this BP algorithm for the Steiner tree, which I cannot prove converges, but I'm going to try to apply it or variants of it in systems biology. Okay, so the biological problem, you know, the standard dogma is that DNA is transcribed to RNA, is transcribed to proteins. The proteins then go and they sit on the DNA and they cause some parts next to it to be transcribed more quickly or more slowly. And so, we get an interactome, okay, a gene regulatory network. And that's why, you know, we have the same DNA in our 200 plus kinds of cells because there's an interactome going on in them that makes the cells do different things. Okay, so as we all know, problems with gene regulatory networks are um, at the heart of a lot, um, of, a lot of diseases. Okay, so what we would like to do is to learn as much about this gene regulatory network structure as we possibly can. We only have incomplete, um, indirect data. Okay, so I would like to in infer what the network is, and also I would like to identify particular nodes in the network which people hadn't realized were part of the network. Okay, so there may be some proteins that are floating around in the cell that people thought had nothing to do with a certain network, which actually turn out to have to do with it. If I can do that, then maybe some of them could be drug targets. Okay, so the drug discovery paradigm is that there are a lot of different kinds of genome data. We put them into different computational models. You've heard a little bit. You're going to hear a lot more about this tomorrow. And one of the things we can get out are points of intervention, drug targets. Okay, so one kind of data is gene expression data. This is some of the oldest kinds of data that, that people use. So micro, uh, uh, gene microarrays tell us which gene is expressed in the presence of which other gene under a particular set of circumstances. So I do one experiment and I get certain genes expressed in the presence of other genes, and then I do another circumstance and I get some other snapshot in it. So these are all pieces of evidence which I would like to put together to conclude something about what the network must be. So from the differential, so, you know, proteins have a, a, a background value. So a transcription protein has kind of a background level. And if it's sitting at its background level, 
then I think, well, it probably doesn't have anything to do with this process that's going on. If it's way underexpressed or over un, underexpressed or overexpressed relative to the background level, then it's more likely that it has something to do with the process that I'm looking at. Okay? Now, that's not a conclusive statement because it could be that at its background level it's doing something interesting, but it's more likely to be doing something interesting if it's underexpressed or overexpressed. Okay, so I'm going to get node weights by whether things are underexpressed or overexpressed. And I'm going to get edge weights by looking at everything I know about the given organism and asking how often is it that protein I seems to interact directly with protein J. This is very dirty data. You're putting together lots and lots of different data sets, okay? But that's how you get your, your edge weights. Okay, and then how do we determine the network most likely to have given us that data? So now what I'm gonna do is a variant of the Steiner tree problem, which is called the prize collecting Steiner tree problem. So here, instead of saying that there are absolutely privileged nodes, okay? What I'm going to say is that certain nodes are somewhat privileged, some more than others, okay? And I'm going to give them prizes. And then what I'm going to try to do is find a tree which minimizes the sum of the edge weight, so I don't want to have to include more edges than I need to include, minus the sum of the prizes. So since I'm trying to minimize this and I'm subtracting a prize, what that means is if something has a big prize, I want to try to include it because that's going to make this thing small. It's going to help to pay for these edges that I've had to buy. Okay? And as this parameter lambda goes to infinity, then anything that has a positive prize must be in there because otherwise I would pay negative infinity to not put it in there. Okay? So so, um, so what happens is that this just turns into the old Steiner tree problem, okay? So this is a version of the Steiner tree problem in which we don't have absolutely privileged nodes, in which we have nodes that are somewhat privileged, some more, more than others. Okay, so the mapping to the biological data is that I'm going to say that I look at everything that I know about this organism and there are, you know, let's say there are 5,000 proteins and I look at every possible edge and I ask what are the odds that, you know, of all the things that people have seen about this organism that this protein interacts directly with that protein. And if it's known to interact a lot, then this weight is going to be very low and I'm going to want to try to include it. And if it's known to never interact, or it's never, not known to never interact, but never been seen to interact, this weight is going to be pretty high, and I'm going to tend not to, to include it. Okay, and then for the node weights, what I'm going to say is that if this transcription protein is sitting at absolutely background level for, for the organism, then it doesn't have any prize whatsoever, okay? But if it's underexpressed or overexpressed, it's going to have a prize, so I want to try to include it. So what I'm thinking is that what I want to include are the things which seem to be underexpressed or overexpressed, and I want to include edges where proteins are known to interact directly with each other. Okay, so in the standard Steiner tree problem, a Steiner node is a node that wasn't a privileged node, but nevertheless, we included it in our minimizing tree because it allowed us to hook up a lot of the privilege nodes. So in the prize collecting Steiner tree problem, here in this picture you just think of these as the cost of the edges and, these as the, pri and, and the size as the prizes on the nodes. So I want to include in my minimizer the nodes with big prizes, okay? And I don't want to include these heavy edges because they cost me a lot. So I'm definitely not going to include those heavy edges that I don't need to include. But I land up having some nodes in this which don't have much of a prize, but they help to connect nodes which have big prizes 
to each other. Okay? So this one, for example. And so in the context of gene regulatory networks, when these Steiner nodes show up, what they are is proteins which a priori you wouldn't have guessed were involved in the pathway because they're sitting near their background level, but somehow they are connecting other major players in this pathway, other players that some experiment is telling me are major players. So just at their background level, they may be doing something very important. Okay? So the first example is the yeast, um, yeast pheromone response pathway. A lot is known about yeast. There are 4,600 and some odd proteins. There are 15,000 known protein-protein um, protein, protein interactions. So the protein-protein interactions I read off of some database. Um, very, very noisy data, okay, <laughs> and changing all the time. But, you know, if proteins are known to interact with each other a lot, then I give it a very low weight so that I tend to include it in the minimizing solution. We considered 56 large-scale gene expression data sets. So these are like 56 different experiments telling us this gene is expressed in the presence of that gene but not in the presence of some other gene, okay? That one experiment gives us a set of differential expressions, so node weight. From that one, I construct a tree. I do this 56 different times, constructing 56 different trees, which tell me, oh, these are the players in this tree, and oh, that guy didn't look like he was a player, but he showed up. And now I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again. I have 56 trees. These are bounded depth trees. I merge the solutions to get one network. The network is no longer a tree. Okay, so we identify, so this is the pathway that we got. We were mathematicians and theoretical physicists, and so we ran around and tried to get biologists to do this, and we ran around a lot because they didn't know whether to believe us or not. Um, but we finally found some wonderful people in Toulouse who actually did an experiment for us. So let me show you what we got. So there were two types of proteins on our theoretical network that we found. Okay, there were proteins which were differentially expressed a lot, so we weren't surprised that they showed up. There were other proteins which were not differentially expressed very much, but they seemed to bridge very important players in the network. So this was an example, this cos 8, that was the one that, that seemed to be the, 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 top, the top surprise. So we asked, is, is this important? We found a group in Toulouse that helped us knock out, well, they knocked it out. We didn't, I'm <laughs> not gonna mouth by pet anything anymore. Um, so uh, they knocked out <laughs> the, um, the, the gene for that and the pheromone response pathway failed. So this was experimental proof of the importance of this Steiner node. Nobody had suspected that that node had anything to do with the yeast pheromone response pathway, but it seemed to have. And it just came out of a minimizing solution that it was connecting things that we knew were, were important. Okay, but you may say, you know, who cares about yeast? You know, I'm not, you know, if you tell your mom you're working on yeast, she's like, okay, you know. <laughs> okay, so, um, Yeast is a wonderful organism, but it, you know, people love to do mammals if they can. So the problem with mammals, incomplete interactome data, 10 times as much, um, 10 times as many transcription factors, uh, huge, um, huge intergenetic regions. So we need fast algorithms. Okay, so what we looked at was glioblastoma, okay? which is a horrible kind of cancer. Um, it's the cancer that uh, Ted Kennedy had. And, you know, if you have surgery, which means going into your brain and doing stuff, right, and chemo and radiation, then um, the median time you live is one year. So it's a really, really horrible cancer. It is four times as common in men um, as in women, and it, and it was not known why. Okay, so can we find a glioblastoma pathway using the prize-collecting Steiner tree? So first, how do you choose the root? Remember, we had to choose this root, you know, this R that we put it. Well, a good thing to choose as a root is a receptor protein. 
because they are often the start of the signaling pathway. So we chose EGFR, which is, it's, it's well known that mutants of EGFR are um, major players in a lot of kinds of cancer. Okay, and we got this pathway, okay? And if you're a biologist, which I'm not, or the right, right kind of biologist, you look at this and you say, oh yes, it makes, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. This is DNA damage repair stuff. There are all kinds of things that are quite well known here. Okay, but there are also things which, okay, so what the color means here is that if it has a big prize. Since we made EGFR our root, we gave it a really big prize. <laughs> okay, and there are other ones which were very underexpressed or overexpressed, so they got big prizes. The size has to do with how central they are. In, in this. So the size is telling us how central this is. So the ones that are kind of surprising are the ones that are very central, but we didn't give them any prize. Okay? So the top five nodes ranked by a kind of centrality. You could use different kinds, but you get pretty much the same list. Okay, the first one, it turns out, is well known. It had a relatively large prize. The second one, it had no prize that was not previously known to be a factor at all, okay? So what is it? It is the estrogen receptor. So this is the first pathway link between glioblastoma and gender, okay? And then to do an experiment, what we did was we took the EGFR, um, uh, EGFR inhibitor and added estradiol, which is estrogen, to cultures of glioblastoma cells and they seem to do much worse than just with the EGFR inhibitor. Okay, so, you know, I don't know how you get estrogen into the brain, um, but possible drug therapy if you could manage to deliver some estrogen to the brain. Okay, we also did multiple signaling pathways because very often there are multiple pathways that are involved in one disease. So how do we do this? Well, we did a Steiner forest instead of Steiner trees. So you could do something like put in K disjoint trees, or you could let K variant put in a parameter. And to implement it, we added an artificial node and connected everything to that node. So here's a picture. The artificial node is sitting out here. Everything connects. And then when you find the minimizer, you find, oh my, it breaks into these pathways. So it reveals parallel working pathways, plus it also gives you on the different pathways Steiner nodes. Okay, so we did this for the yeast pheromone, um, uh, yeast pheromone response network found, um, found interesting results. We also did it for glioblastoma, and we found a lot of parallel pathways. So that was very interesting. Okay, the thing that we've been working on for the last year, I think, is the most exciting. Um, we did an extension to patient-specific network. So we call them multi-prize collector Steiner forests. Okay, so we went to the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a great data set. We took breast cancer data from the Cancer Genome Atlas. And here's what we wanted to do. Each one of these is a patient, okay, a different patient with breast cancer. And we had both the tumor cells and the normal cells of these patients. For each one of them, we learned individual forests, okay? And then we clustered so that we had similar forests. Then within each cluster, we extracted shared characteristics. Okay, so these are the important things in these forests. And then we took those and fed those back into the entire thing so that we updated the prizes for everyone based on what we found from these clusters. So it's like what you're doing is that, first of all, each patient is different even within a cluster, and we find that with cancer. But then even from one cluster to another, yes, they're different, but maybe there's some information that's useful across the clusters that we can feed in, and we iterated. And what we found was highly patient-specific networks which had input from patients who seemed to have different kinds of breast cancer. And one of the things, that, the most exciting thing that we found was that we found one cluster of breast cancer patients which had a Steiner node in it which indicated that there was an important protein in that pathway that people had not realized was associated with breast cancer 
but that was known to be associated with a certain type of gastrointestinal cancer. And in fact, there is a drug, an approved drug, for that gastrointestinal tumor. So now the suggestion is that you try this drug just, just because we found a Steiner protein, which looked like what was going on in, that, in those gastrointestinal tumors, the, the suggestion is try this on this particular cluster of breast cancer patients. So the summary is that graphical models give us succinct representations which capture the local, um, the local dependencies of random variables and with the right representation, we can even do this for things that don't just have local constraints. Belief propagation gives us a way of approximating marginals and maximizers of these problems. Rigorously, we can prove that it converges in particular cases under particular circumstances. Even when we can't prove that it converges, it seems to do very well on benchmarks and in certain kinds of problems. And there's biological evidence that what we learn from the BP algorithm for the Steiner tree tells us about regulatory pathways, and I think more interestingly, finds proteins on those pathways which were not suspect before because they were sitting at their background levels, but that a minimizer tells us are probably important. And then we can go in and test those as possible drug targets and as possible personalized drug targets. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Jennifer, do you know what, any idea what the biological basis might be? So mechanisms for which Steiner nodes that you find that are not differentially expressed might actually still be important? Well, you know, it, it, it could be, I mean, it's not like um, something has to catalyze a, a reaction. It could be that some protein is, is sitting there, okay, and the ones that we're seeing differentially expressed are in some way catalyzing reactions going up and down, and then other ones are just part of what's going on in relatively small quantities. They are very important to the pathway. So if they sit at their background level, they can still be operative. It's just without looking at Steiner nodes, we wouldn't have had a signal from the, the gene chips, from the microarrays, that they were important. So uh, there's a new technology which involves sequencing the RNA rather than using these chips, which have loud noise, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, RNA-seq. And right. there, there's, you know, there's tons of data sets around. Have you, have you thought about using other sources? We are, we are starting to use some other sources, and RNA-seq is one of the ones that we're using. Yes, definitely. Hi, thanks. This is fantastic stuff. I love seeing that there's, like, real potential, real impact from these mathematical ideas. Um, so the idea of using BP and... There are little giggles here. I'm not yeah. sure that, they, that this really, that this stuff, but anyway, uh, it's some it's, of the same people, if not the same, whatever. It's yeah. certainly a lot closer than, than if we just have these pr theorems and proofs, yeah. Yeah. which, 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 <laughs> which are pretty, saying, which yeah. inspire right. us, but yeah, go but, on. Um, so <laughs> so the, the idea of using BP and these probabilistic inference ideas mm -hmm. to solve these optimization problems is you know it's, it's nice algorithmically, but then it also has these implications about there's a, there's a probability distribution that you're that you're working with. Now, mm -hmm. is there any interpretation of this this Steiner tree pr probability distribution in the biological setting? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, we are not. I'm not claiming that we're getting the optimum. So the probability distribution, in fact, is giving us many possible optima and. So far, we've just been lucky that the nodes that, you know, the first ones that we've gone to test in some way look really good. I'm sure it's going to be that there are cases in which they're not. We have to go back to the probability distributions. We have to look at them, and other things are going to pop up. So they're, they're, yes, we, we, we definitely want the information about what are some of the other near, near minimizers. 
So about the convergence proof for the B matching case, mm -hmm. are there other types of combinatorial optimization problems where you can make a statement like this? So for example, the Nash bargaining problem, which is um, a problem, it's a, it's a network um, uh, Nash, uh, Nash equilibrium problem where you can bargain with your neighbor on the network, but you can only bargain with one neighbor or B neighbors if you're talking about the, the B matching problem. And one of the nice things is that people had, found, had proved some theorems about finding Optima in a global way that when you talk to real economists said, didn't, you know, there is no master who is dictating everybody who is selling a house in this state coordinates with each other and this person sells to that person, that person sells. So it's all done through local interactions. So when we did the BP proof, it also corresponded to the kinds of interactions that real economists thought are probably more likely to take place. And it was a, a really complicated proof, but it was also nice that, that, that the economists said, oh yes, and this is probably how it happens in the real world more than these um, global optimization proofs. Okay. Uh, we are in the medical field, so I really appreciate your, your result. The question is for your algorithm like in terms of convergence or the speed of convergence, uh, how, what kind of things that it is it's, it's most sensitive to in terms of like the, the noise in the data or the quality of the existing, uh, like the data knowledge base that give you the So um, we definitely do pre-processing uh -huh. <laughs> on the data, trying to remove some of the noise. And you notice, you might have noticed, there are some parameters in there. We had that lambda parameter in there. Uh -huh. We have the depth of the tree in the prize collecting, the, the debounded prize collecting Steiner tree. And so we do make use <laughs> of these parameters to try to remove as much noise as possible. So we optimize over those various parameters to try to get something that is more, uh, more robust, less sensitive to some of the noise in the data. Okay, time for maybe one more question. So he's asking what kinds of sensitivity results are? Are yes. known for the parameters for the edge weights or the node weights, since in your setting these seem to be very noisy and uncertain. Yeah. So as I was saying, I mean, they, they are, I mean the, the data sets we're, we're given, especially the human data sets, um, you know, we can't, I mean, we can't tell them to go back and collect more tumor data. Um, so, uh, we do find sensitivity to this. I mean, we definitely find sensitivity. And as I was saying, we try to use these additional parameters to move to a kind of solution that seems to be less sensitive to, to the noise. So that's how we optimize those parameters, to try to make it more, more robust to the noise that is definitely present. So we'll pull out certain patients and see how robust it is to pulling out certain patients and try to choose parameters where it's less sensitive to that. Okay, let's uh, thank Dr. Chase once again. <laughs>
like float around and target specific cancer um, cells and release deadly payload on those. Um, so you can see there's these two halves that are latched together. On the inside, uh, there are um, treatments, either like antibodies or toxins. And when this thing is folded up, uh, the environment is shielded from these chemicals. And on the front, there are these two sensors, which are latches. And if it senses uh, surface proteins on cancer cells, specific cancer cells, then it unlatches and opens up and delivers its deadly payload. So you can imagine all kinds of things like that, where you can either make these nano devices or reprogram cells to uh, do really useful things for people. On the left, you can see uh, some, uh, the heading and some of the summary of a review article from a few years ago about some of the challenges that um, this field is facing. So specifically, uh, there's, it's really hard to actually identify the operational um, um, properties of some of these components that you're trying to reconnect. Um, when you connect them, you often get nonspecific interactions between pieces. Um, and then once you characterize them, which is often a very difficult and painful experiment, so uh, people don't do that that much, but even if you do, often the operational um, um, parameters of, these, uh, of inside cells and inside biological systems are really different from when you, op when you characterize them, so you get a lot of um, uncertainty in the execution. But if I were a roboticist and you gave me a whole bunch of crappy sensors and lousy motors and some nuts and bolts, I can probably hook up a pretty reliable robot by exploiting some of these things uh, from machine learning that would allow me to do parameter estimation or let me just, uh, sorry. Let me just get rid of this one. Yeah. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so I can use machine learning techniques to like estimate parameters or do um, estimate latent variables of this of the state. Right, so specifically, what we're able to do is we're able to take a, a belief propagation on factor graphs, which is a pretty general and uh, very useful um, machine learning technique, and compile it down into a chemical reaction network so that you can potentially use it at this molecular scale. So you might be able to use uh, these types of algorithms to estimate latent state variables of your environment or estimate parameters um, of, of, uh, of your networks or do something like sensor fusion. And this is the cartoon that I want to keep you in mind, uh, have you keep in mind. The middle is this potato-shaped cell, and it has two sensors, and it's trying to figure out what is in the environment. And these sensors might be noisy, and what's even worse, um, a and B can both trigger either sensor, it's just that one is more likely to trigger one of the sensors than the other. And we would like to come up with some kind of network that we can put, in, <laughs> that we can put inside, uh, the cell, inside the cell so that it can do uh, this kind of estimation and figure out uh, what's going on outside the cell. And the reason that we focused on reaction networks is that those are really, you can think of that as the assembly language of all things that are small. Right? So inside cells and biological systems, you often model things as chemical reactions because you have chemicals floating around inside the cell. But even if you have non-living things, as soon as they get small enough and they're driven by thermal ag agitation, uh, you really describe the behavior of the system as a chemical reaction network. So next, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the model that we use for chemical reaction networks and then how we use that to implement message passing. So a chemical reaction network, you typically describe it as a set of species, here Z, uh, Z1 through Zm. And then you write down reactions with this arrow notation where I have the reactants on the left-hand side, and each chemical species has a non-negative integer um, in front of it, which is the number of uh, species types that participate in that reaction. Then at a rate of kq for reaction q, um, it turns into the products, um, which are, uh, again, non-negative integers in front of all of the uh, species types in the reaction. I can write that whole thing down a little more compactly, just as a triple um, R, which has this uh, reaction, reactant vector, um, where a lot of the entries could be zero, the reaction rate kq, and then a uh, product vector, which has entries for all the things that come out of the reaction. And once I have a whole bunch of these reactions, I get a network and I can put them all together in a set R and that describes uh, what can happen in the system. So just a very quick uh, example here is a very small, simple reaction network, um, which is two reactions and three chemical species, A, B, and C. Um, and uh, the reactant vector for the first reaction is one, two, zero, which means one A, two Bs, and no Cs interact in this reaction. And it happens at a rate of K1. And then it turns into uh, the product vector uh, 101, which means uh, there is one A, no Bs, and a C. A has kind of a funny role in this reaction because it doesn't really get consumed or uh, created. Uh, it just you know, stays the same. Um, 
because it has the same entry in the uh, reactant and product vector. So we can think we think of these species as catalysts for the reaction because they end up influencing the rate at which this reaction proceeds, but the concentration of them themselves doesn't change. So once I have this reaction network, I want to figure out what the dynamics of these uh, different species are. And for that, we used a pretty general model uh, that people use called mass action kinetics, which describes the evolution of concentrations of different chemical species. So uh, we denote the concentration just as a bracket around the species name. And the law of mass action says that the rate of change of a chemical species is just given by the sum over all the reactions Q that it participates in. And for each one of these reactions, I get a term uh, that is KQ times the product of all the, react the concentrations of the reactants in that reaction uh, times the net change of uh, that chemical species in that reaction. So if I'm given a reaction network, I can just plug it into the law of mass action and get a dynamical system that uh, describes the evolution of all the concentrations of the chemical uh, species. So in the simple example that I just showed, uh, for the uh, the concentration of uh, C, the rate of change is just has two terms because there are two reactions in the network and it participates in both. Um, and it's just K1 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B squared because it shows up twice, uh, minus uh, K2 times the concentration of C. So that's the dynamics of the system. And now I want to use this, uh, this system and the dynamics to do, uh, solve a machine learning problem. And the uh, specific problem that we're solving is message passing on factor graphs. And uh, I guess this is, we just talked about this, so I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, in a factor graph, there are two types of nodes, uh, variable nodes and factor nodes. It's a bipartite graph. So every, um, every uh, factor node is, com is connected exactly to one variable node. And what this graph describes is how the joint probability distribution over all the variable nodes, how that factors into smaller pieces. And in addition to telling you how this thing factors, um, as we just saw in the previous talk, there, it also gives you an efficient way of computing the marginal distributions on the variable nodes. So uh, there are two types of messages to, do the, uh, to um, implement message passing to compute the marginals on the nodes, where each node just looks at all its incoming messages and then uh, uses those incoming messages to compute an outgoing message that it sends to one of its neighbors. And uh, depending on if it's a message from a factor node to a variable node or vice versa, you use either some messages or uh, product messages. And if you want to compute the marginal distribution at a variable node, um, the algebraic form is very similar to a product message. So I'm not going to talk about that separately. Um, cool. So this is the thing that we want to do. And now I'm going to talk about how we represent uh, this, the, the quantities in this particular algorithm and then implement it as uh, chemical reactions. So in this algorithm, I have all these probability vectors. So one of these messages, P, uh, the pro product message going from one to three as a vector and has two entries if it's like a two, two valued uh, a random variable. And to represent any of these vectors in this algorithm, um, if it's a K vector, I'm going to use K plus one chemical species. And uh, this extra species, uh, which has the subscript zero, uh, I will think of as unassigned probability mass. And the concentrations of the other chemical species correspond to entries in that probability vector. So for example, uh, the concentration of uh, P1 uh, on the right corresponds to the first entry in this probability vector, which is the message that I want to send. So then to implement message passing, uh, I need uh, three different types of reactions. Uh, and the first one is just as this, uh, one of the simpler ones. It's just uh, implementing product messages. And I put the algebraic form of a product message in the title of the slide just to remind you what we're shooting for. And to implement it, um, we came up with this following set of reactions, which takes unassigned probability mass of the message. So it has the subscript 0. And then the messages, uh, the incoming sum messages, catalyze it and assign it to a certain um, entry in that vector. And if I take all of these uh, messages and plug it into uh, the law of mass action, I get the steady state solution on the bottom, which you can see almost looks like the right thing uh, that I want to compute, except for it has this factor in front of it. Um, and this uh, term, uh, kappa r, I'm going to talk about in a few slides, but this global uh, parameter that you can uh, tune. And what is important about this is that in this particular message, all these factors are the same. So I can just think of renormalizing it and getting the right answer. So I get this concentration, and I can uh, think of it as a likelihood that's not normalized. 
or if I can somehow reason about uh, the fact, if I can somehow guarantee that there isn't much unassigned probability in this particular uh, set of belief species, then the, uh, then I can directly interpret the uh, concentrations as entries in this probability vector. Okay, so the sum messages uh, look very similar, um, where the uh, unassigned probability mass for a particular sum message gets catalyzed by all uh, the incoming product messages. Um, and, other, and the only difference is that instead of having this k product, which is uh, just a parameter that's the same for all of them, the reaction rate is uh, entry from this factor table. Right? And again, if I take all this set of reactions and plug it into mass action, uh, at steady state, I get this uh, following, um, this following equation uh, for the concentrations. And again, I get this constant factor in front of all the entries, which means that um, by the time this settles down, I can uh, compute the, I can interpret the, the, um, the concentrations uh, either as a likelihood or if I can guarantee that there isn't much unassigned probability mass, probability mass left, I can directly interpret the concentration as probabilities. Okay, so these are the two types of messages. Then there's one more thing that you need to worry about because all of these, uh, these two messages, they assign unassigned probability mass and assign it to something. Um, but once all this probability mass is assigned, I might get stuck in that solution. And because I'm doing this computation all the time, uh, I need to make sure that I can get out of that, uh, that particular solution. So we added recycling reactions, um, which is where this global parameter KR comes from. And what it does is it takes assigned probability mass and turns it back into unassigned probability mass so that it can, uh, can be recomputed and recatalyzed by incoming messages. And this thing also gives you, uh, this, uh, tuning, this parameter KR also gives you a tuning parameter to trade off speed versus accuracy. Because if I go really slow, most of the probability mass is going to stay assigned because I'm just siphoning off uh, stuff very slowly, but the whole reaction proceeds very slowly because I'm not recomputing my messages uh, quickly. Okay, so uh, we were able uh, to take, uh, we, so we took this like, very simple factor graph um, and compiled it down into chemical reactions. We added some uh, factor, some came out with some factor tables, um, and uh, also changed here. You can see that there are two uh, factor tables psi one, uh, which correspond to changing information coming into this graph. And we changed it uh, this particular entry halfway through our simulation when we simulated the um, the uh, chemical reaction network. So here you can see uh, the output of the simulation where uh, the pr probability assignment is color coded. The probability of a random variable being in state one is red, and state two is blue, and where it's applicable, um, it is in state three, and unassigned probability mass is white. Um, and you can see that if we have uh, two different tuning parameters for the uh, uh, recycling rates, uh, for the slower recycling rate on the top, um, these reactions, they settle down and they settle down um, you know, slower, but they hit these black lines, which are the exact uh, solution for this inference problem. And on the bottom, we tuned up, we turn uh, the reaction rate higher by a factor of 10, and you can see that the transitions are much faster, like the whole system computes much quicker, but there is much more unassigned probability mass left. Okay, so, uh, but, and we can take this, uh, this is just a small example because it's easy for us to visualize, but we can really take any type of discrete valued factor graph, compile it down into chemical reactions, and run it. So just to uh, go over why that works, um, the, the, the real trick is that we came up with like a good representation of the problem as a set of belief species which are internally conserved and just catalyze each other. And, uh, the reason that it's easy for us to actually show that we compute the right thing is that this law of mass action has the right algebraic form uh, at, for computing the sum messages and the uh, product messages. Uh, we have this big sum term, and if we represent the problem right, it just, like, the algebra works out very nicely. Um, so this is a simple example of a machine learning algorithm. Then we think that uh, even that simple example might have some pretty useful applications. Um, uh, if you go back to the beginning, uh, I showed this cartoon of doing sensor fusion inside a cell, and it would be very nice uh, inside a cell or even outside a cell where people try to come up with these uh, 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 in vitro uh, computational devices with DNA computing to, try to take uh, noisy sensors and combine them um, to get better sensor data out of it. Uh, in terms of uh, moving the theory forward, there are a lot of opportunities for simplifying the compilation procedure and maybe cut down on the number of reactions and the number of chemical species that you need to 
um, did you need to express these um, these problems? And then, uh, really, in the long term, you know, we're thinking of this as a first step, as uh, looking at the intersection of doing uh, doing like molecular engineering and machine learning. Um, so there are lots of other algorithms besides belief propagation and factor graphs that would be extremely useful uh, for building these machines and building them quicker and having them operate more reliably. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, Ryan Adams, who I did this work with, and then my postdoc advisor, Radhika Nagpal, um, who uh, I mostly work with on distributed algorithms for robotics. And then uh, David Solovicek um, at USF, who uh, is an expert in DNA computing and computing with reaction networks, who helped us uh, come up with this idea and uh, brainstorm. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and answer any questions you might have. And there's a poster that you should come visit us at. We have time for a couple of questions. Terry? So this may have been implicit in your talk, uh, but uh, you seem to have one parameter which control the rate of the reactions, but every reaction has a, a different reaction rate. That is to say um, you have on rates and off rates are those also included in your model? Yeah, so, uh, so we're thinking, so reaction networks kind of have this dual role in this, in this realm. We use them as model to describe things that you find, but we can also think of them as specification language. So there is a way of taking arbitrary reaction networks and compiling it into uh, DNA strand displacement cascades, where you can basically pick how your chemical species interact and you can pick the, the reaction rates. Um, so it's something that we think we can pick or you know, if we can only pick some of them, maybe we can tune them to play nicely with all the other ones in the reaction network. More questions? So given a real world uh, reaction network, could you reverse compile it into a graphical model? Uh, real world, ah, uh, okay. That was a point right here. I have no idea, but I think it's a great question because uh, if you look at these regulatory networks inside cells, uh, people often think of this as feedback control mechanisms or uh, noise rejection mechanisms. And because that's uh, like an engineering thing that people have wrapped their head around and that uh, the people in the control and systems community have really understood well. But it really seems like uh, cells need to perform inference on some things. And it would be really interesting to see if some of the networks you find um, if they correspond to some kind of belief propagation or some kind of uh, inference computation. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It would be great if it did. So I, <coughs> I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So I think you mentioned in the paper that for a graph with four random variables, you need 115 um, of these reactions. How does it scale with the number of random variables, roughly? Yeah, so um, it scales with, you know, linearly with the number of messages you need to send, right? So it depends a little on the connection topology, but uh, and like the connectivity of the graph. So each edge that you add, you need to add species for and need to, rea need to add reactions for. But there are really, you know, there, might, there are probably lots of ways of making this simpler. Like this is like the most general way of compiling anything into reaction networks. But if you had a specific problems, you probably wouldn't need to compute all the marginal probability distributions. Or you might be able to omit some of the factors or roll them into uh, other problems, uh, smaller things. Yeah. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. You can. So our next talk is titled Information Theoretic Lower Bounds for Distributed Statistical Estimation with Communication Networks by Yuchen Zhang, Don Ducci, uh, Don Ducci, Michael Jordan, Martin Ray White from Berkeley, and Yuchen is speaking. Uh, thanks for giving me this chance to present the NIPS. This is a joint work with uh, John Ducci, Michael Jordan, and Martin Wainwright. Now, let's becoming, uh, start to think about a modern data center. This picture shows a Google data center. It hosts more than 10,000 machines and boasts uh, data storage and data processing, a very uh, highly, distri uh, highly distributed. Uh, in such a large scale system, people have to worry about not only computation 
efficiency, but also communication efficiency. And in fact, the intermachine communication cost could become a major efficiency bottleneck in such a large scale modern uh, distributed system. If we want to learn something from um, uh, distributed data across many machines, there are two things that we want to optimize. The first thing is that we want to maximize the statistical accuracy. And the second thing is that we want to minimize the communication cost. But usually these two targets conflict with each other. If you want a high statistical accuracy, the only way to do this is to perform estimation on a large volume of data. But to do this, a high communication cost is almost inevitable because we have to aggregate information across many data sets. Therefore, there must be a fundamental trade-off between accuracy and communication, and this trade-off must be satisfied by all distributed algorithms. The main contribution of our, of our work is to provide a theoretical characterization to this fundamental trade-off between accuracy and communication. Our main result lower bounds the estimation error as a function of the communication cost. More concretely, uh, as the communication cost increases, we show that the achievable estimation error decreases at a specific rate until it reaches the optimal accuracy for any statistical procedure. Furthermore, we show that this lower bound is tight, that is, it can be achieved by concrete algorithms. Now, let's formally define the problem we want to solve. We want to solve a statistical estimation problem. In statistical estimation, we have an unknown distribution P and some ID samples from P. And the goal is to estimate the parameter theta as a function of P by looking at the samples. As a concrete example, uh, in the Gaussian location model, P could be a normal distribution and theta is the population mean. Uh, other examples include linear regression and probability regression. We'll discuss these three models later in more details. On the last slide, I didn't specify the volume of data I have, nor do I uh, spe uh, specify the way the data is stored. But um, if we are given very large scale data, then they're usually stored in, very, uh, in a very distributed way across many machines. In such a setting, we call the original statistical estimation problem as a distributed <coughs> statistical estimation problem because both the data storage and computing are performing in a distributed way. Because the data is separate, machines have to collaborate and communicate in order to perform a joint estimation. We formalize this collaboration by communication protocols. And we begin by considering a simple communication protocol where only allow one round of communication. In this one round of communication protocol, every machine constructs a message based on its local data and send a message to a fusion center. Then the fusion center uh, aggregate the information from the messages and output an estimator be, uh, based on the messages. Remember there are two things that we are, uh, we're interested in trading of. One thing is the statistical accuracy that is measured by the mean square error between the estimator theta hat and the true parameter theta. And the other thing is the communication cost that is measured by the total length of messages that's been generated in this process. I'm going to give you a simple example to give a sense of what this trade off looks like. Let's consider a simplified version of the Gaussian location model. In this model, there are M machines, and every machine gets uh, one instance from the same normal distribution, and the goal is to estimate the population mean. This problem can be solved by a very simple algorithm. In this algorithm, every machine first discretizes its local instance and send to the fusion center. Then the fusion center averages all the instance it receives uh, as the estimator. By classical theory, it is easy to show that if we encode every message or every instance in log m bits, then the mean square error achieved by this algorithm is in order, on the order of uh, 1 over m. This is the optimal, conver optimal convergence rate for the problem or the optimal accuracy for the problem. On the other hand, uh, for communication cost, since every machine is exactly one instance, and if, we, if, you ignore, uh, if you don't care the logarithm factor, then the total communication should be uh, proportional to the number of machines or proportional to M. If an algorithm achieved the optimal convergence rate or the optimal accuracy, then I call it as an optimal estimator. The algorithm shown on this slide is an optimal estimator and its communication cost is on the order of M. Now I'm asking the question, is there any more efficient optimal estimator that communicates much le less than M bits? Now, according to our theory, the answer is no. We show that for the simplified version of the Gaussian location model, any optimal estimator has to communicate 
uh, at least the order m number of bits. By this result, the lower bound matches the upper bound provided by the algorithm on the last slide. It shows that the minimum possible amount of communication uh, for an optimal estimator for this specific problem is exactly in the order of m, where m is the number of machines in distributed system. I want to add a remark about the non-triviality of this result. Imagine that the m instance is not stored distributedly, but on a single machine, so that uh, order computation can be computed locally. In this case, a message of log m bits is sufficient to encode a solution to send it to the fusion center. In contrast, in the setting of distributed estimation, we have shown that it is necessary to communicate m bits in order to achieve the optimal rate. By comparing these two communication complexities, we see that uh, we have proved the exponential gap in m between the centralized procedures and distributed procedures. Now, uh, by warming up this, this simple example, we're now ready to come to uh, see a more general version of the Gaussian location model. In a more general model, we have still have n machines, but every machine has n data points sampled ID from a d-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And the goal is to estimate the mean of Gaussian. One of our main results, lower bound estimation error as a function of the communication budget. Or in particular, what we show is that if an estimator communicates no more than b bits, then its mean square error is lower bounded by a constant times this blue term times uh, the maximum over two other terms. The blue term is actually the optimal convergence rate or the optimal accuracy for the problem. So that if the communication budget B is large, then the lower bound matches the optimal rate. It means that if you have a sufficiently large communication budget, then the distributed algorithm can achieve the optimal rate. On the other hand, if the communication budget B is very small, then the red term here can be substantially greater than one. It means that the lower bound can be substantially greater than the, the optimal rate. It means that if you're given very limited communication budget, then no one can achieve the optimal rate. Finally, it is straightforward to verify that the minimum uh, possible amount, amount of communication to make the lower bound matching the optimal rate is exactly in the order of d times m divided by log m. Here d is the dimensionality of the problem, m is the number of machines, and we only have this logarithm dependence on m in the denominator. This slide shows a graphical representation of the last theorem. The horizontal axis is the communication cost, and the vertical axis is the mean square error of the estimation. Our theorem shows that all distributed algorithms must lie above this blue curve. As the communication budget increases, the achievable uh, estimation error decreases until it reaches the optimal accuracy. And the critical point at which uh, the uh, the, the, the lower bound matches the optimal rate is roughly in the order of d times m if ignore the logarithm factor. By simple calculation, we can also draw the plot for centralized uh, estimation. In the setting of centralized estimation, all the data is stored in a single machine and estimation is performed locally. And in this setting, only d times log m bits is sufficient to send, a, uh, to send an optimal estimator to the function center. Again, comparing these two communication complexities, we see another exponential gap between uh, the centralized procedures and the distributed procedures in a number of machines M. By knowing the lower bound, let's also look at an upper bound. The upper bound is achieved by exactly the same averaging algorithm as we use for the simplified version of Gaussian location model. In this averaging algorithm, every machine first average its local instances and discretize this average and send it to the fusion center. Then the fusion center output the estimator as an average over all the messages it has received. It is easy to show that by using this algorithm, the mean square error we can achieve is in order of d divided by mn, that is the optimal accuracy, and communication cost is in order of d times m times log of mn. If we ignore the logarithm factor again, then this upper bound matches the lower bound on the last slide. So we can see that for this generalized uh, version of the Gaussian location model, it is necessary and, if, and, and sufficient for an optimal estimator to communicate d times m order of bits, where d is the dimensionality of the problem and m is the number of machines in the distributed system. Our theory not only applies to the Gaussian location model, but also applies to some regression problems. Two examples, the linear regression and probability regression. For both regression problems, we have m machines, and every machine has n data points. Error machine has n data points, uh, sample ID from a distribution characterized by the parameter theta. 
every data points in, in the form of a pair x and z, where x is a d-dimensional feature vector and z is a response value. In linear regression, z is defines a linear transformation of x plus a Gaussian noise w. And in probability regression, z is binary. It is either one or zero. And the probability that z is equal to zero is defined as a probability link function of a tra linear transformation of x. And here, the, uh, the probability link function is the CDF of standard normal distribution. The goal of both problems, both regression problems, is to find the, is to estimate the regression coefficient theta that is a vector in the d-dimensional Euclidean space. We can prove exactly the same lower bound and upper bound for the regression problems as we have proved for the Gaussian location model. For lower bound, we show that any optimal estimator has to communicate on the order of d times m divided by log m bits. On the other hand, by a previous result by Ducci, Wainwright, and I, we show that there is an averaging algorithm that matches the lower bound. Uh, this algorithm works very similarly to the algorithm we used before. So it's like uh, in every local machine, every machine uh, computes a local solution based on its local data and send the local solution to the fusion center. Then the fusion center open an estimator as the average over all the local solutions. Uh, and it can be shown that estimation error achieved by this algorithm is optimal and the communication cost is on the order of d times n uh, times log of m n. When we uh, don't care the logarithm factors, then uh, again we see that the lower bound matches the upper bound. Uh, so far, we have discussed uh, uh, a single round of communication protocols. We can study more general communication protocols by allowing multiple rounds of communication. Uh, in this more generalized version of the protocol, in each round, every machine sends a message not only based on its local data, but also based on all the messages generated in the, previous round, in the previous round. And finally, estimator is based on the messages. This protocol can be illustrated using the diagram on this slide. There are multiple rounds of communication between the individual machines and the fusion center. In each round, every machine constructs a message and sends it to the fusion center with communication cost. And the, and the fusion center broadcasts all the messages it has received back to all the machines without communication cost. This is called a free uh, broadcasting model. In this model, we're still interested in two things. One thing is uh, still the statistical accuracy that is measured by the mean square error. And the other thing is the communication cost that is measured by the total length of messages that the individual machine has sent to the fusion center. For this more general setting of the communication protocols, we can still prove lower bound. We can show that for Gaussian location model, linear regression, probability regression, and for the problem of dimension one, uh, any optimal estimator has to communicate on the order of m bits. This is a tight lower bound. Uh, it shows that interactivity, interactivity doesn't help to provide a higher communication efficiency because the communication cost is still proportional to the number of machines. On the other hand, when the problem is of dimension d, this lower bound may not be tied because uh, the lower bound has no dependence on the dimensionality d. And proving a tied lower bound for this multiple rounds of communication and for arbitrary dimensionality remains an open problem. Finally, I want to sketch some main ideas that we used to prove the result. Remember that uh, we want to uh, lower bound estimation error given a communication budget. So in the proof, we first fix the communication budget B. A C essential gradient of our proof is to establish the following inequality. We upper bound the mutual information between messages and uh, parameters by the product of two terms. The first term is mutual information between uh, the parameter and data. And second term is the mutual information between data and messages. Because uh, parameter data and message form a Markov chain in the communication model, this kind of inequality can be seen as a type of uh, data processing inequality. And it has a useful, prob useful probability that the two terms on the right-hand side of the inequality can be upper bounded separately. For the first term, it is, because it is message independent, we can control it without considering the communication protocol. For the second term, by the definition of the mutual information, it is bounded by the entropy of the message, which is further bounded by the length of the message. So the second term is controlled by B. By having the upper bound for the two terms on the right-hand side of the inequality, we get a, 
we get an upper bound to the uh, mutual information between parameters and messages. And then we can use this uh, upper bound and the mutual information to lower bound the estimation error by using the classical argument in information theory. For example, by applying the final scene quality that connects mutual information and the uh, estimation error. For d-dimensional problems, actually there's a tighter inequality. Uh, this is obtained by dividing the, uh, having the right-hand side of the data processing inequality divided by d. And of course, this stronger inequality is harder to prove. We can prove it for one round of communication protocols, but we find it's hard to prove it for uh, multiple rounds of communications. This is, why, uh, this is the reason why proving a tight lower bound for multiple rounds of communications and arbitrary dimensionality is an open problem. Okay, let me summarize uh, our result. In this talk, uh, we have characterized the fundamental trade-off between accuracy and communication for statistical estimation. We have studied two communication protocols, allowing either one round of communication or multiple rounds of communications. For each communication protocol, we lower bound three classes of problems, Gaussian location model, linear regression, and probability regression. There are a few open problems for future works. One is that uh, we can generalize the result in this talk to some other statistical estimation problems. And one promising direction is to generalize to any statistical optimization problems with some specific property. And the other open problem, as I mentioned, is to prove a tight lower bound for arbitrary uh, round of communication on arbitrary dimensionality. This turns out to be a more challenging problem. Okay, so this is all I want to talk about in this presentation. Uh, thanks for listening and welcome to ask any question. So <clears throat> while we field questions for you, Chen, please could the spotlight presenters step up to the podium? So the key to your proof is really this uh, data processing inequality, right? Uh, yes. Because it says that you can't do a smart compression of your data, even if you know what, that what you want to do with this smart compression is to estimate the parameter. Yes. Uh, yeah, actually the essential point is that, okay, uh, is that uh, I upper bound mutual information by the product of two other mutual informations. Yes. And one term is for the actual the, the message entropy. And another term is actually for the compression efficiency. And this compression efficiency uh, can be upper bounded, but only for uh, only if your distribution has some specific property. Like if your distribution is a Gaussian, then because of the tail of Gaussian has some desired property, you can Uh, this this uh, compression efficiency, but for other problems like if you want to estimate the mean of a uniform distribution or a family of uniform distributions, then the efficiency here is very different. So it is specified in in the poster. So if you're interested, you're welcome to uh, to see the poster. Very good. All right. Let's thank Yu Chen again.